you know, going a little bit upstream uh, to what we've been exploring, um, the issue uh, in relation to uncertainty, I think, is really important to touch into. You know, how do you create the kind of faith, hope, confidence, security um, in a world w which is characterized by not just normal uncertainty, but by radical uncertainty? and um, where the changes are happening at a much faster rate uh, probably than ever uh, in you know, human history in any case. Um, even you know, fast revolutions, um, not having the sort of scale of impact that we're experiencing now. And so you know, part of the process for me is really uh, what can one do to actually create the sort of uh, confidence, not in the future, um, uh, not in hope, um, but in uncertainty prevailing. In today? Yeah. In what we're doing today? Yeah. Rebecca's the master of that. All right, Rebecca. I think of that Pema Chodron book titled Comfortable with Uncertainty, mm. a title I love, because I think one of the problems we face, and Buddhism has a lot to say about this, so I want to pass this to you soon, Roshi, but people wrongly believe that they've lived in some kind of stability and certainty. The world has always been changing. Uh, nature, ha you know, species have been continually evolving. We've had relative stability for 10,000 years in terms of climate. But the uncertainty that makes people frightened, I think, and there's definitely a lot of reasons to be frightened about what climate chaos is bringing right now, has brought and will bring. But uncertainty itself feels like something that's really hard for people to deal with. I think it's less hard when you realize it's where we always were and always will be. Certainty is, you know, is not behind door number two. There's just more uncertainty there. So that's been interesting to me. How, the way people want the future to be decided, that they don't want to engage with things whose outcome is yet to be determined. And a really interesting thing for me the movie, the Terminator movies, I believe, speak to very deeply. I um, love them a lot. Um, they two mo two mottos, one of which is "No fate, but what we make." And Terminator Two, Terminator Three, the future is not yet written. So convincing people that, of course, there's uncertainty because in that uncertainty is freedom. We're making the future in the present. You can look to the past and see how the best things in our lives now are something somebody made in the past. They fought for marriage equality, for women's rights. They fought for environmental protection. I spent most of my life hiking and loving places that were protected because people took action so they didn't get developed. There's a wonderful little meme going around saying, everybody believes those stories about you alter one tiny thing, you kill one butterfly, you know, a million years ago, and the entire future is altered. But why don't we believe that there's one little thing we might do now that could alter the entire future? Why don't... So I really, For the positive. In a positive way. So I want people to recognize uncertainty is freedom, because otherwise we live in some kind of predetermined hell and have no power, that we are making the future in the present. It's a, horrific responsibility, but it's also an incredibly exciting opportunity. I also want to talk about cl the, how people behave in disasters, but we'll save that, because it's very <laughs> much reminded me of Paradise Built in Hell, where we were going with it. But So the uncertainty thing, I think, is so interesting, but it's also, speaking well, of Pema Chodron, such a right. Buddhist principle, no, it's, it's, codependent it's, arising. You know, every, well, it's, it's also the, the case that um, there is nothing that is certain. And you know, how do you actually cultivate the capacity to live with radical uncertainty? Since everything is impermanent, everything is uncertain, and um, the tendency to grip, to try to fix and fixate things, um, is uh, what causes suffering. And you know, it's greed, hatred, and delusion. So you know, I'm I'm always dancing with this question of. Um, why is, uh, since uncertainty prevails, why uh, don't we come to terms with it and actually be curious about it and be you know, in this sort of field of uh, surprise? And the word that we shared just a few minutes ago was possibility. 
the possibilities are phenomenal, both on the positive side and also on the toxic side, the negative side. And, you know, uh, one other point that I want to uh, just bring into the conversation, and that is uh, the issues around the victim narrative. That, you know, if we feel that we are victims of the system, um, it's, it's our agency is completely uh, abandoned. And uh, it is really, you know, in a certain way, again, to understand a sense of, uh, you know, incredible possibility and responsibility. And, you know, as we meet an emergent, uncertain uh, world moment by moment. And so I want to go, sorry, I want, I want to go into the, um, the victim thing in a bit. But I first wanted to suggest why is it that we are so attached to the myth of certainty? Because it's a myth, right? But we, we want to make it real. And there are many reasons for that. But um, one reason could be that we have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of years controlling our environment, thinking that we can control. So let's go back to originally we gorgeous humans were hunters and gatherers and we were led by the flow of nature and we went where there was a tree that was fruiting or there was an animal for eating but we were very much in tune with the flow and the abundance of nature and then we decided that's not enough and now we actually have to settle and we have to become farmers, and we have to take a chunk of land, and we have to make it produce, and we have to domesticate animals so that they stay here because they can't roam the savanna, and we have to domesticate land okay. because this is my land. Control and, and extraction. Control, property, and ownership. Yeah. That is where patriarchy starts, right? Because women are part of the property that is where all this myth that we can control nature, that we are superior to nature, that is where we have this in human evolution, we have this incredible break and we disassociate from nature. And we start convincing ourselves of human supremacy and human exceptionalism. And then we go from the industrial revolution to the urban revolution and now all of a sudden you know because we're crammed into small spaces now we have competition for space because this is my little backyard and that's your little backyard and now we have competition and then we interpret Charles Darwin as having said that survival of the fittest he never said that Spencer. Right? Right. that was Spencer's invention Charles Darwin said survival of the fit which means survival of the fit according to the natural adaptation of where you are, but not of the fittest that leads to competition and, and, to, and to scarcity mentality. And then you go from urbanization to the industrial revolution. I mean, honestly, if you're looking at this from somewhere else, right, in the universe, you go like, are they completely nuts? Then we go to the Industrial Revolution, and then it's no longer enough to domesticate that which is on the surface and control under our property. Now we have to dig underneath the surface. Then we go dig for fossil fuels, and then we go overfish under the surface of the water. And now, you know, extractivism is just completely out of control. Consumption is completely out of control. But out of our conviction that we can control and that certainty is part of our natural experience. And the oh, amazing thing about this... No, wait, 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 hold on. You are saying certainty is part of our natural experience. It's, I, I think it's part of our constructed Yes, experience. yes, but the myth is right. the myth is that it is part of our natural right, experience, right. right? And therefore, when I don't have certainty, then I get all upset. But 
to me, the, the, I always look for humor because otherwise I, I don't know that I can get up every morning. But the humor of this, the irony of this, is that that is what we have done over the past 12,000 years. Over those 12,000 years, those who lived, well, you and I, not Rebecca, who is a babe, but you <laughs> and I were born in the previous geological era. That's right which was the Holocene, yeah. the past 12,000 years, right? And the Holocene, the fun thing about the Holocene is that it was the moment in which nature provided humans with the sweet spot of all of the natural conditions for humans to thrive. And we thrive so much that we over, over consumed, not realizing that nature was gifting us with this amazing, amazing set of very complex conditions for us to thrive. And what did we do in those 12,000? We extracted, we lived from nature, extract, 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 thinking that that was what we did. Then in the 1950s, no surprise, we all of a sudden move into a different geological era. It used to take millions of years to go from one geological era to another. No, 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 no. Now, in one decade, we move from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. And now we're living, you were born in the Anthropocene. 1950s? I was on the same age as the Berlin Wall, doing somewhat better than it. So well, the beginning you of the 60s, 1961. So you are born in the Anthropocene. We are born in the Holocene, right? So here we are, two geological eras. I mean, it's really, it's mind blowing, isn't it? Mind blowing. I, I didn't know I was on that side of the divide. I just knew I was born at 313 parts per million, which is a hundred par plus parts per million. One less than of there the is effects, now. exactly. One of the effects of the Anthropocene, because parts now parts per million of carbon dioxide. Parts per million of carbon dioxide. Yes. Because the Anthropocene, what it is, is the fact that now humans have stolen the pen of history from nature. Now we are writing history. Nature used to write the evolution. Now we are holding that pen. We stole it from nature at nature's expense. And now the question is that we should all be engaged in. So what's the rest? You know, we know that we started in the 1950s. Is that what we're going to continue? Or do we have the opportunity of rewriting what the Anthropocene is actually going to be? Can it be the geological era in which we finally woke up? to the understanding that we are not separate from nature. We are part, an integral part of nature. We cannot live from nature, we have to live as nature. That is the challenge right now. Forget about certainty. There is no certainty. Nature doesn't provide certainty. Nature provides flow. It's an organic process. Let's get with the program, folks. I just want to put a <laughs> footnote in there about the word we, because the one of the things that happens with climate is people saying that, you know, humanity, all of us are the problem. A very few people benefit from the fossil fuel industry, from climate chaos, who are immensely powerful in erecting obstacles to what the great majority of people want, which is climate action, a safe world, a long future, a good relationship with nature. The great majority of people on Earth are also not the problem. The top 1% has a I think the top 10% of humanity has a much bigger climate impact than the bottom 50%. I may be getting the proportion slightly wrong. The top 1%, um, you know, is consuming way above it, you know, what, you know, a farmer in Bangladesh is not the problem at, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, you know, a Bolivian potato grower is definitely not the problem. And so I think there's also this interesting thing where, there's humanity as a whole, but there's also in terms of beliefs, values, commitments, and benefits, we're really fragmented and some of us have benefited hugely and they've tried to convince us all that we're all benefiting and we don't want anything to change and change means loss. And, the, and what they're doing now is the, some of the loss that you're grieving, it's producing extinction, damage, record heat, um, forced migration, climate refugees, etc. And so I just always want to distinguish that the great polls show that even in the US and the UK, the great majority of people want to see climate action. Um, they, you know, and that 
the people that were constantly being told that climate action means sacrifice and that we somehow live in a wonderful age of abundance. But we don't live in an age of abundance about, of confidence and hope in the future, an age of feeling good about our relationship to nature or even time to relate to nature. We don't live in an, uh, literally in an age of abundance for the huge proportion of people on earth who are of poor. Of justice? Yeah. yeah. Of distributional justice? Yeah. And, uh, Health? Yeah, and we're seeing um, in so many ways, including in the global north, capitalism figure out how to impoverish yeah. the majority even more while they profit even more. And uh, speaking as somebody who lives in Silicon Valley, which has eaten my beloved San Francisco alive and seeing the corrosive horror of all those billionaires who can't stop grasping. So that's just my footnote for the word we. Yeah, no, good well point. I'll stop there. Good point. Yeah, thank you.